And we pray. Heavenly Father, again, as we come to you, I want to say thank you for the, just the precious Word of God. Lord, I thank you for having us be able to see the Word of God. Lord, just not only that, but able to speak the Word of God. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Ghost in my heart. Lord, we know that this is a spiritual discerned book. Now, Lord, as we come to you tonight, Lord, this is on a Monday night revival. Lord, I thank you for those that's come out tonight. And Lord, I know it's dark, and it's rainy, it's dreary. Lord, there's some that's made an effort to come to the house of God. And Lord, they've come tonight. Lord, I've seen them with a smile on their face. And Lord, it seems like they have a joy about being here tonight. And Lord, that just revives and refreshes my soul in a mighty way. Now, Lord, as we come to you tonight, Lord, we know and realize this is a fresh service, a new service. And Lord, I thank you for what you gave us last night. But Lord, we're anticipating. And Lord, we need something tonight out of thy word. God, I pray you'd touch my heart, my mind, my lips. Lord, I need to be right in tune with you tonight. God, I pray I wouldn't say nothing astray. Lord, I don't want to bring reproach against the name of God. Lord, I don't want to push these people away from you, but Lord, I want through the word of God and the help of the Holy Ghost to draw them near to you. And God, I pray you'd revive us. We do ask this in the name of Jesus Christ tonight. And Lord, I pray that you'd just be at everything that's done. Lord, we plead the blood upon the service and on the remainder of this service. Lord, I pray you touch the hearts of your people. Lord, I pray you touch my heart, my voice. And Lord, you know the congestion and the allergies that's going on. But Lord, I pray you suppress that and put it aside just for a little while. Allow me to speak clearly. Lord, that they can understand me. Lord, we do love you and we thank you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Y'all may be seated. <coughs> Help me, I do ask for. Let's get in the context of the scripture. And, and back in Genesis chapter number 45, Joseph has revealed himself to his brothers. And we see that, he, that they were grieved and rightfully so because they've been living a lie for many, many years. And they've been hiding this lie. And all of a sudden their lie has finally come to them face to face. And can I tell you, uh, this ain't part of the message. And if you lie long enough, can I tell you, your lie will catch up to you. And their lie finally caught up to them and they come face to face with Joseph, the one they sold <coughs> into slavery. And verse number five, it says, Be not greed. And so they were greed within themselves. But Joseph, the kind and, and gentleman that he was, he said, Be not greed with yourself. And he says, Neither angry with yourself that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. And how it talked about in, in verse number seven, how it was a great deliverance. And I'm glad that there is a great deliverance in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is a great deliverance. Amen. And uh, they come down. And, of course, the fame of Joseph's brothers went out. And Pharaoh caught wind of it, what was going on. And Joseph, he commanded, uh, and Pharaoh commanded Joseph to send some th wagons down to get to his family. And they did send wagons. And, boy, we can look at them wagons tonight. And the wagons of provisions and the wagons of promise. And, boy, how much them wagons meant. And he sent them wagons. And he gives his brothers the commandment in verse number 24. And he says, see that you fall not out. By the way, and so Joseph, as of course type of, the, of God, uh, of God the Son, he sent them, and then there's a great missions verse in here, and he sent them, and they went and they told. And can I tell you, that's exactly what we need to do today. God sent us. We need to be, we need to be sent. We need to go, and then we need to tell. And so Joseph's brothers went to their father, and they told all the words of Joseph. And they, and of course Jacob, he didn't believe them at first, and I don't blame him. We'll come back to that here in just a moment. And he looked out and he saw the wagons and Jacob, he saw that and he says, it's enough. He says, I'm going to go see Joseph uh, before I die. And one of these days, I'm still working. I've been working on for about two years now a message on things I need to do or things you need to do before you die. And so we've been, I've been studying that for quite a while and God will bring it together one of these days. And, and Joseph, he says, it's enough. And we get down to Genesis chapter number 46 and it says in, in Israel, he took his spiritual name it went from his fleshly name to his spiritual name, Israel. And it says, And Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father, Isaac. And I want to look at this thought with the help of the Lord tonight. And I believe, I believe this is right on where God wants me to be. But I want to look at a thought, how to make it through a desert experience. How to make it through a desert experience. Now, for those that's read the Word of God with me, you're going to say, well, I didn't read anything about a desert in there. And you're right, you didn't. 
Some things that are said are not said. And I was studying these verses out one day and I was coming through this and I did a three-year study on the life of Joseph, just a personal study of mine. And I, of course, if you're going to come through Joseph, you're going to come through Genesis chapter number 46. And I got to 46 verse number 1 and I was doing some personal study on this and I got to study and I got really intrigued on that verse that Jacob changed his name and went to Israel. He took his journey and he stopped off at Beersheba and I was very curious why he was stopped there and figuring out why he was stopping there because it was the last spot that he was going to go to before he was going to Egypt. But the problem that was lying between him and Egypt was a big desert. And can I tell you, there's going to be some deserts in your life and I got to studying some deserts in, in this little globe of this earth that we live on. And do you realize there's five different deserts on this old world we live on? Now, I'm not going to give them to y'all because we'll be here all night. And I don't want to put y'all in the desert without getting you out of the desert. Amen. And so we see that there's five deserts. So I'm going to give you three of them real quick. And, and before I do that, what is a desert? Well, this is what Noah Webster's 1828 says a desert is. It says it's a barren or a desolate area. It's a dry, often sandy region of little rainfall. It's extreme temperature and sparse vegetation. It's a region of permanent cold that is largely or entirely devoid of life. It's also a, an apparent lifeless area of water. It's an empty, it's a forsaken place. It's a wasteland. And so we see that a desert's not a very enticing place to go. And, and of course, we, when I say desert, most people, they automatically think of a desert that's a dry area and it's just nothing but sand and it comes from hot during the day and it's very extreme cold at night. And can I tell you, spiritually, we'll go through them days in our life where it seems like it's real hot and it's real challenging. It seems like there's nothing growing, nothing happening, but yet at night it turns cold. And I want to tell you, spiritually, you'll go through them in your lifetime. And then there's also those cold deserts like the Arctic Circle above in, in Alaska and I've been in 20 different mission trips above the Arctic Circle and I've been in different villages above the Arctic Circle uh, in the last I guess the last six or seven years or so and I've been in different villages going door to door and passing out Bibles and holding evangelistic meetings and it's a cold area up there and it does warm up in the summer times but I was in a village and this Eskimo come to me and they, they're just Eskimo Indians. That's what they like to be known as or, or what Indians they are. And, and I was up there and there's not much to do in a village. And so we were sitting there during the day and we were talking and this guy come to me. He was from the village and this is how they talk. He said, uh, you want to come see my freezer? And that's how they talk. And I was like, well, yeah, I'd like to go see your freezer. And I was just looking for something to do, amen. And I wanted to spend some time with the guy to talk to him. And, and so we went and we said, we'll be there in just a few minutes. We went to his house. You walked. And so we walked to his house. The village is not very big. And we went there and knocked on his door. And he uh, took us around the back side of his house. And there was a big building he had built up there. And he said, my freezer's in that building. And I'm like, well, let's go look at it, you know. And I was, I, I was just excited just to spend some time with him. And I was expecting a white chest freezer is what I was expecting. And he opened up this old building, and I walked in, and there was nothing in the building. And I'm like, well, where's your freezer? And he says, you standing on it. And I says, I'm standing on it. And he uh, says, stand back. And he lifted up a, a door on that building we were in. It went down in the ground, and it was dark down there. And I said, you got a flashlight? And he handed me a flashlight, and I shined it. It was 20 feet deep. And from the top of that, that hole down to the bottom of that hole, it was nothing but a solid block of ice. And, I, and it was 20 feet deep, and he had a ladder that went down there. And I climbed down in that, and I went down in there. I said, I got to go down in there. And when I got down in there, I shined a light, and I got to looking around, realizing I wasn't the only thing in that freezer. And, and uh, I looked down in there, and there was a big old tail. I mean, a big whale's tail that was down there in the bottom of that, that freezer. And I... Guy got real inquisitive because this man's about 400 miles from the ocean. And I said, sir, I said, uh, how'd you get this whale's tail in your freezer? He says, in the winter, he says, you go in and get it with snowmobiling, pull it on the snow, and I dropped her in the hole. And i like, okay, sir, if that's what you want to do, amen. But I'm going to tell you, there's some times in our Christian life that's exactly what we'll go through, some cold and indifferent times in our lives, and it seems like your prayers don't get above the ceilings, amen. Cold and indifferent. 
Boy, we got that. And uh, another uh, type of deserts that you'll go through is those that starts the rain, but they never experience the rain. And I got to experience this one day on WGCR radio, and we've got a radar that we buy into, and it was during the summer months, I guess about two years ago, and we got one of them summer storms was brewing above us there around the storm, and I was watching that radar, and I worked the afternoon shift that particular day, and I was watching it, and I saw a little old green dot, and I, it, it started to form, and it formed right around the radio station, and I got on the, on the radio, and I told people, I said, folks, we've got a, a storm that's brewing over WGCR, and I says, it's, it's starting to intensify, and boy, that storm, it went from a light green to a dark green, and it started to grow, and it started to grow, and I mean, it was right over the radio station, and, and it went from dark green to, to red to yellow to a dark, dark orange, and when it gets to that orange, it's bad, you know, and and I'm saying, folks, I said, we've got a frog strangler fixing to hit our area here. And I says, it's going to be raining cats and dogs before it's over with. And I watched the wind and that. And I mean, the, the tree in front of, me, of the window, it was a blowing. I was watching lightning. I was hearing thunder. I could smell the rain. I could almost sense that the rain was there. And I got on there and I said, folks, I don't understand this. I says, it's, it's, it's raining. It's supposed to be raining right over our radio station. But I says, there's nothing happening. I said, there must be something wrong. And I was watching this storm. And, and boy, all of a sudden, I mean, it was somewhere. And I was just watching it. And it never did rain over WGCR. So I was a good meteorologist. Most of them lie, right? That's what we say. They can't predict nothing in the mountains. Well, a guy called me up. About 10 minutes after that, he said, Brother Jones, I said, yes, sir. He said, I appreciate you telling us about that rain. I said, what rain? He says, that rainstorm you were telling us about. He says, I'm a mile down the road from y'all. He says, going towards Hendersonville. He says, it's raining so hard, I had to pull over on the side of the road. He says, I couldn't see anything that was going on. He says, it was raining like crazy. Can I tell you, that's exactly the way it is in some services. You'll sit in there. You can sense God's all around. You can feel the breeze of the Holy Ghost is a-blowing, but it doesn't seem like he's a-raining on you at all. And people around here are getting blessed. People are shouting and rejoicing in the good things of God. And you're trying to sit there and say, well, why come I'm not getting anything like that? I'm telling you, it's a desert experience sometimes. I've got to experience that spiritually in my life as well. Boy, I'm telling you, you're going to go through some deserts in your life. I believe Jacob gives us a prescription here out of Genesis chapter number 46. How to make it through a desert experience. Number one, we've got to worship. If you're going to make it through a desert experience, you need to learn how to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It says here in verse number 1, And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And so we see the first thing he did was worship. What does worship mean? Well, worship means this. This is what the Noble Webster's 1828 says. It says, Chiefly and eminently the act of paying a divine honor to a supreme being that's what he says i'm going to change that and it's paying a divine honor to god amen and it says in the reverence and the homage paid to him in a religious exercise consistent of adoration confession prayer and thanksgiving amen well we need to learn how to worship and i'm just going to take them how and and, and, uh, and just go through some of these in that definition number one we need to be thankful amen i appreciate the prayer your pastor prayed tonight about he was very thankful about the things that was going on. But can I tell you, in our days that we're living in, we're very unthankful. We're very unappreciative. We got a generation coming up, don't appreciate anything. Testing my girls, I'm going to tell my girls, and I don't normally do this. But I did something for them the other day. So I just laid it out there, and when I got up, I left early and laid something before where they sit and have breakfast, something special. It took them all day. Finally, come and give me thanks. I said, wow. I said, somebody give me that. I said, I'd thank them right away. And I did, I did it as a lesson. Say amen or a mean dad, whichever one y'all want to choose. But we're very ungrateful at what God's doing. We need to be thankful. If we're going to make it through desert experience, we need to be thankful. I was at a revival meeting in China Grove not too long ago. And I was preaching a week's meeting or maybe a, a Wednesday, a Sunday through Wednesday. I don't remember what it was. And on a Monday, I was there Sunday. And on that Monday, we were in the prophet's chamber. And my wife, she said, you need to look out your window. 
And I said, what for? He said, just look out. So I looked out my window and had Venetian blinds, and so I did the stalker thing. And I just did one of these. <laughs> Most people do this. I don't do that. I just did one of these and just looked out. Well, I watched, and I saw that there was a push mower down at the end of a sidewalk. Well, I, I got to watching, and this man, and I'm being very sensitive with this, and I'm being very respectful. But this colored man, he was in a wheelchair, and he was rolling down that sidewalk. And I said, he's not going to do what I think he's fixing to do. And he had one good arm and one bad arm. He had a prosthetic leg, and he had a brace on the other. And I got to watching him. He wheeled himself down to the edge of that sidewalk. He put his little brakes on. I mean, he positioned himself. I said, he's not going to do that. And he pushed himself up with that one good arm. I watched him. He leaned out and he pushed himself up and he stabilized himself and he just sort of locked in right there. And I said, he's not going to do that. And with that one good arm, that man reached down there and said, that mower cranked up, and I watched him, and he smiled real big. And I mean, he is just grinning from ear to ear. I mean, a man with a bad arm and a good arm and two bad legs and a wheelchair. And he was down there, and all of a sudden, he grabbed that old mower. And, and Brother Coates, he didn't mow it like we would. We striped everything. He just was a mowing, and he was a smiling, and he was a mowing. Took him all day to mow that little piece of ground that he had. It didn't have a big lawn. It took me about two minutes to mow his grass. But he did it in little segments because that's the only way he could do it. And he had a smile on his face all day long mowing that grass. I got under such conviction, I just bowed down there where I was, said, Lord, I pray you'd forgive me. I've taken for granted the two good legs that you've given me, amen, for the two good arms that I have, the voice that I can go into and walk into the house of God. I said tonight, Lord, I'm going to walk in that church. I'm going to have a smile on my face. I'm going to raise my hands to a holy God. I'm going to walk on two good legs, amen. And I'm going to praise you with a smile on my face, amen. I tell you, we walk in here with you and sit down with the audacity. Lord, you can just bless me if you can, amen. Amen. If we're going to make it in these days, we're going to have to learn how to be thankful for what God's given us, amen. I mean, God's probably done something for some of y'all in here, and you've probably said something like this. God, if you'll do this, I'll stand up in church and give you the thanks, and you have yet to do it in your, and what you told God you would do. Amen, I'm telling you. I'm so grateful I can come to the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. God's been good to me today. He's fed me. He's clothed me. He's put shoes on my feet. I'm telling you. I, I run up right, come over here in a full tank of gas in my car. I mean, I was watching a man driving over here. Boy, I thought we had crazy drivers back in Mills River. I think y'all got us beat over here, amen. <laughs> Somebody's driving a brown Chevrolet truck, but you scared me tonight. Because he's in the left. There must be somebody here with a brown Chevrolet truck. <laughs> but I just thought he was going to wipe out that concrete guardrail. I mean, he was, I mean, he was that close to it, and I was slowing down because I said, he's coming in my lane if he hits that over there. But yet, God, I watched him, and I backed off. He just sort of straightened it right up. I said, thank you, Lord, for protecting us, amen. I said, that's just the mighty hand of God, amen. We had dinner to eat on our table, amen, not everything we want to have. I mean, it wasn't steak and, steak, but steak and baked potato and a salad, but, boy, we sure did eat good before we come over here tonight. What has God done for you today? That you said, well, if I go to the house, God, I'm going to, and preacher says, if anybody got a word, I'm going to stand up and give you thanks. Can I tell you? That's worship, amen. That's part of what we need to do. God's been so good to us, and yet we say so little, amen. If we're going to make it through a desert experience, we need to know how to worship. We need to give thanks, amen. The Bible says, Psalms 92, I think it is. I believe it's Psalms 92. The Bible says, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and sing praises unto the almost high. It means that it's profitable, amen. The only thing I know on this side of eternity that's profitable besides leading somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ is giving him thanks. Amen. So we need to be thankful. Not only that, confession. Here's a good one. We need, to, we need to have some confession going on. We got so many churches that are arguing. There's people that sit on this side 
won't sit on that side because so and so sitting over here. Amen. And we got so much animosity in our churches. Boy, it breaks my heart. I mean, we're supposed to be what? A family. Now, I know we have our disagreements. And we don't always agree on everything. Amen. You, I told somebody last week, I said, you hang around me long enough, I'm going to make you mad. I said, because you're not going to agree with everything that I say. Say amen right there. That's our biggest problem between me and my wife. She doesn't always realize I'm always right. Amen. She would do that. We wouldn't have half the problem we're having in our house if she just agreed. Honey, you're right. Amen. Amen. I was driving home from, <laughs> she doesn't grieve the Holy Ghost. I can feel it. I got a long ride home. It's an hour home. It's going to be a long one too. I'm taking the shortcut. I was driving back from South Dakota a few weeks ago. I was coming through Knoxville. Well, I got caught in traffic, and my wife knows how much I love being caught in traffic. I mean, I, love, I desire it. So she calls right at the time I'm stuck in traffic. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting in traffic. She says, I guess that little preacher boy that's with you is finally learning who you really are. I said, I'm on speakerphone. <laughs> and this, she got real spiritual. <laughs> and she, oh yeah. And she says, well, God may be keeping you from something. From home. Yeah. <laughs> well, I finally, I said, I'll see you later. I've done, I've lost half y'all. I'm at the close, we're at the close in prayer. Say amen, go to the house. But uh, she says, God may be keeping you from something. I said, oh, hush. So I hung up. Well, we got down the road. Sure enough, there was an accident. I told that preacher, I says, I'm going to have to apologize. My wife just sure as the world. He said, what are you talking about? I said, she's right. Amen. But I'm telling you, we've got so much animosity in our churches today that if we're going to worship, we're going to have to get a clean heart with one another. The Bible says if you got ought against one another, make it right. I've dealt with a church back in the mountains, won't tell you the church, but they come to me and said, Brother Jones, we need to talk. And I said, all right. And they said, we're having a squabble in our church. And I said, about what? They said, well, half the church wants to put in a, a furnace. And I said, okay. And they said, the other half wants to put in a heat pump. And I said, what's the problem? Well, we can't decide. And it'll cause a split in the church. What would you do? I said, put them both in. He said, what? I said, put them both in. And when it gets winter, turn them both on. I said, it'll heat the church twice as fast, and everybody will be happy. But I'm telling you, we got so much animosity in our churches that we can't get along. Amen. It's hindering us getting through the desert. See, Jacob and his sons had to get right somewhere. See, Jacob's son has been lying to their daddy for all these years. They haven't told the truth about Joseph. They just said a wild beast has tore up your son and he's dead and they brought him back to coat and blood and they've been holding that lie for years. And all of a sudden they got to come back and say, Dad, we're sorry, Joseph is yet alive and he didn't believe them and I don't blame them, I wouldn't either. But somewhere in that line, they had to get right, amen. If they're going to worship, if Jacob was going to actually worship the Lord there at Beersheba, him and his boys had to get right and have forgiveness with one another. I'm going to tell you the reason we're not worshiping God is that there's too much animosity in our churches, amen. Grieving the Holy Ghost. God help us. In prayer, I hit this last night, I won't labor. Boy, we need to get back to prayer. And then adoration and recognizing who God is, amen. He's God, he's holy, amen. 
He's the Alpha, the Omega. He's, he's, a, he's, he's everything that we need. I'm telling you, I'm so grateful, the faithful and true, amen. Boy, he's been so good to us. It would do us some good to, I, I guess would be the right way to say it, is embarrass this flesh sometimes and just get up on our feet and just raise our hands and say, God, we love you. Adoration. We see that you need to worship. Abraham worshiped in Genesis 22. Job worshiped in Job 1 verse 20. Moses worshiped in Exodus 15. Oh, we need to worship. Amen. Secondly, we need to wait on God. I've labored on that first point too long. But we need to wait on God. It says in, the, in Jake and Israel offered up his sacrifices. And it says in verse number 2 that God spake unto Israel in the vision of the night. When you do your sacrifices, when Jacob did his sacrifice, he had to do it during the day. And God didn't answer him right away. We're living in such a society of microwave popcorn and instant food in five minutes and have a five-course meal done in the microwave, and we're expecting God to do the same thing. Can I tell you, God's not in a hurry, amen. And, I, and they said, Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But he did it to show them that he has power, amen. Well, one of the hardest things you'll do is wait on God. I had a dear man of God, he says, as when I surrendered into full-time evangelism, he took me to his house, and, and he, called, he, I, he allowed me to preach for him that Sunday night, and he said, I want you to come to the house. We want to sit down with you. And this is a dear man that I love. He's one of my heroes. He said, Brother Jones, he said, I need to ask you some questions. He's been at this way longer than I'll ever be. He's been at it over 50 years. And he says, will you take some advice from an old preacher? I said, sir, anything you give me, I'll take it to heart. He says, God's not in a hurry, son. He said, what are you going to do when you have an open Sunday? I said, I'm going to be at my home church, agging my pastor on. He says, you're not going to go to other churches in hopes to get somebody to ask you to preach? I says, no, sir. I said, my God's bigger than that. I says, he can fill my calendar in if he wants to, and he can take and fill every date that I need to have filled in, and if he chooses not to fill it in, I'll be at my home church agging my preacher on, but I'll just wait on God, amen. I'll tell you some of the things that we have the struggles to do in our, in our local churches is wait on God. It's one of the hardest things you'll do. Boy, when I got out of Bible college, I wanted to go full-time in the ministry, but it didn't happen overnight. It took some time, and God finally just sort of rearranged my life and allowed me to go full-time in the ministry, and boy, I love that, amen. I was willing to do whatever God wants me to do. Three things you'll do when you wait on God are three things waiting says about you. Number one, if you'll wait on God, you're being submissive. Be it blessings come through those of submission, amen. Boy, when you're waiting on God, you're submitting to his will. Well, I had to make a decision last week on something that's monumental. I mean, it's big in my ministry. It really is. It's something that, there's something that hinges on this one decision, and I hate to say it that way, but Brother Coach, it does. There's some things coming up. It's all right here teetering on one decision. And yes, I could have went out last week, and and I could have took care of it at the bank. But God says no. And I've been waiting on God. And it seems like God's going to work that out. And boy, I, but I could have went and did it my way. And boy, it could have put me in years of problems. Sometimes waiting on him. But I want to be submissive to him. Not only that, it says I'm trusting you. Trusting and believing God is, is the way to blessings and can I tell you, church, we need to trust him, amen. There's some things you need to wait on him, but trust that he's able, amen. And then you need to honor him. The lesser waits for the greater. I'm waiting on God. I am the lesser. But the greater always blesses the lesser, amen. You need to wait on him. Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I want you to listen to what comes when you wait on him. I waited patiently for the Lord in Psalms 40, verse 1. And he inclined his ear, his ear unto me and heard my cry. Isaiah 40, 31, and it says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall, not maybe or happenstance, the Bible says you shall. 
renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not we- and be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Lamentations 3.25 says this, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. You see all the good that comes on waiting on him. I think sometimes we've messed up and think that we need to push God along and thinking we can do it better than he can. Or he needs our help. Can I tell you, God don't need our help, amen. Jacob, he, give his, uh, he offered up his sacrifices and then he just waited on God. One of the hardest things you'll do. And if you're going to go through a desert experience, you better have a word of God. Jacob got a word. It says, and God spake unto Israel. Then in verse number 3, and he says, I am God, the God of thy father. I'm big on verses and big decisions in my life. Uh, in my ministry of my evangelism, going into evangelism, I was being candidated by a church, and my desire was to always pastor a church. It's always been my desire. And I've always wanted that. And I had a prayer list out of, God, if you're going to give me a church, this is what I'd like to have. And I know there's no perfect church. They all got their problems. And there was a church candidate me down in, uh, in Rutherford County. And boy, I'm telling you, it, it was one of them churches. If I had my prayer list and lined it up beside this church, God answered everything in that church. And then, boy, God, every time I'd go by a graveyard, I'll never forget it. I'd go by a graveyard before I got to that church. And God would say, this is not it, son. This is not it. And every time I'd come by that grave, I'd tell my wife, God says, this is not it. <laughs> Boy, I'd say, God, I need a verse. <laughs> if you want me to do what you're putting on my heart, I need a verse. And I was coming verse by verse through the Genesis 45 with the academy back at Anchor. And I got to chapter 45, verse 24. And it seemed like God blew it up and says, see that you fall not out by the way. And boy, God says, stay right there where I have you, son. And I took that verse, and that's my verse for my ministry, Hedges and Highways Ministry. And I pinned it on Genesis 45, 24. See that you fall not out by the way. Stay on course that I got you on, son, and I got my word. Not only that, but we'll see the word of God, and you'll see God with you. He says, I'll go with thee. I want to hit this last point, and... We see the working of God in going through this desert. Number one, you see the peace of God. He says, fear not. Can I tell you, if God tells you to go through a desert, can I tell you, you can go through it with peace. You may think it's going to be a rough spot. It is. But God's with you. He says, fear not. He says, the peace of God. And then we see the presence of God. He says, I'll go with thee. Boy, you need God to go with you. Amen. I like that, that great uh, poem that man writes in the footprints in the sand and just paraphrasing it. And we probably all know it. And he got to them rough spots in his life. And he said, God, where were you in these rough spots? When I look back, I only see one set of footprints. And just paraphrasing what that poem said, he says, Son, it wasn't you that was walking, but it was me that was carrying you through that time. And I'm glad that God can do that. But I want to look at posterity of now I'm going to finish up here my mind this is how I think God why send 70 souls to a desert why not send Joseph down to his daddy it seems more logical seems like Joseph could have a few entourage and have the comforts of what he had and bring him through the desert instead of Joseph Bringing 70 souls to the desert. And I said, God, why? Why would you do that? And I got to reading it and it finally clicked why he did that. Hey, children, we got in here. Would, would, they, would y'all, young lady, would y'all come up here, please? Would that young man come, would he, please? How many children do we got in here? Young lady, would you come here, please? Will you not? Too bashful. That's okay. I'll use these two as an example. I love children. Especially those who got fingers in their mouth. I really like that. <laughs> What's your name? Haley. Wow, how about that? That's pretty good. What's your name? Caleb. Is that what it is? Caleb. Is that how you say that? Caleb. 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 Is that right? Well, I asked. I said, Lord, why? 
why would you send Jacob and his entourage through that desert? And it finally clicked. Those desert experiences wasn't for Jacob's sake. All the troubles we go through, ma'am and sir, I'd like to tell you it's for your benefit, but it's not. Problems in life I go through, Brother Coates, it's not for me. Yes, it does test my faith, and it does do that. I'll give you that. But what it was for, God says, there I will make of thee a great nation. See, Jacob had to make a decision. Either he could stay where he was at, or he could listen to God and go through that desert. And he had a decision. He could have stayed there. And I believe God probably would have blessed him to a degree. But I don't think God would have blessed him as much until he got to the land of Goshen. It wasn't for Jacob's benefit. It was for the children. We mumble and grumble and complain. And we say, Lord, why me? Well, why not you? Why not me? It could be, come on. It could be that I may face that battle. But see, I've got two daughters. And they need to know what the power of God's about. And see, these children, Haley and Katie, is that right? God. Thank you. Who's going to teach them about the power of God? Is this your boy, Mama? This y'all, this, Daddy, is this your boy? See, it's your responsibility to show them what the power of God's like. And see, either we're going to teach them when trouble comes our way, either we're going to get better or we're going to get bitter. And if we teach them bitterness, that's all they're ever going to know. But Jacob, he wasn't bitter. He went. Went across that desert. And God multiplied the seed of Jacob beyond number. Matter of fact, I'm benefiting from what Jacob did on that day. Because I'm reading about it today, and it sure is strengthening me. So, church, are we going to grumble and complain when bad things happen inside this church? Are we going to take it? And ask God to allow us to show Haley and Kayla what the power of God is all about. See, I want them to know what the power of God is. Because, see, when they got to the other side, I could just about see them grandchildren coming to Grandpa. Grandpa, why don't you tell us how God spoke to you there at Bersheba? Well, y'all just sit down and let me tell you about it. <laughs> And how they got across that desert and how they got to the land of Goshen, which means draw nigh to God. Boy, how God protected them and how God watched over everything that went on. And how, I mean, and what God did in Joseph. And God, Joseph sat down, and let me tell you about great grandpa. <laughs> and how he brought the whole family over here. How God protected you through all the plagues and all of the terrible things that went on. And boy, look at what God did all because Jacob obeyed God. I'm wondering, church, I think we need to show them. Don't you? We say, what's going on with this younger generation? I'm going to tell you what's going on with this younger generation. It's us that's going on with this younger generation. We can point our fingers at that younger generation. Well, they're just not living right. and They're just not doing this and they're not doing that. Can I tell you, I'm not being mean or cold-hearted. But I want you to listen to me. We've got to train them. And so I want my girls and Haley and Kayla to know what the power of God's all about. And if we're going to get it through a desert experience, we need to show them what worship is. Number two, we need to tell them to wait on God and not to trust man and other things to get them what they want. Let's just trust God. And then we need to have a word from God. Speak to them. Let God speak to you and then we need to have God with you. And then we need to see the working of God and how we get to the other side. 
and then we get the posterity of it. And the children get to experience the true power of God. Who are you with, Haley? Who are you with? Who are you with, Haley? Dad. Dad, where's Dad? You, is, these are both yours? Yeah. Oh, they, oh, wow, you got double responsibility. <laughs> are they worth it? Oh, yeah. Let's start showing them. Start showing them. Church, let's start showing them what Caleb and Haley were proud of. We're going to have revival. Oh, we got to start worshiping again. And let us show what these children, it don't bother my children, to get in church services and some little old lady, say to God, they're used to it. Pull out that hanky. At first it scared them. One of them looked at me and said, had that big eye look, and I said, it's all right, man. He's just worshiping God. Now when it happens, they just sit there and they just take it and they know what's going on. Somebody's just worshiping God. I want to show them what the power of God is all about. Let us stand. Y'all two sit right there. Don't go nowhere. This is going to be an altar call. (laughs) Brother Coach, you come on. But I'm going to ask you, church, mom and dad, are they worth it? Why don't you just come down and just Get over them and say, Lord, allow us to show them what the power of God is. Would you like to do that? Amen. Church, it's their responsibility, but they need somebody to back them. You men of this church, what's your name, sir? Matthew. Who's going to get behind Matthew when he gets weak? Says, I will. Win. What's your name, ma'am? Renee. Renee. Maybe some of you ladies says, you know, Renee can't do it on her own. Why don't I just get behind them and show them what the true power of God is and, he- and hedge them up when they get a little weak. That's how I want to show them. I want to show these children what it's like yeah, to get through a man, desert we'll experience, amen, and what right. it takes. Why don't we just get this old-fashioned altar and just ask God to help us get through these desert experiences and just worship God and got God do a work in our hearts here tonight. Brother Coach, you just take it from here. Amen. Let's pray. Everybody get around the altar and let's have, a, have, let's have an altar prayer. Ask God to help us to worship. Ask God to put his hands around these young ones. Mm. Ask God to let us show them what worship is in this church. Oh, God in heaven, Lord, I thank you tonight. Oh, Lord, for this message. God, we've heard. Lord, what a blessing, God, to know, God, that we will go through these deserts. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. God, we're ready to learn, God, to worship thee, God, like Grandma and Grandpa worship thee. Lord, I know, Lord, the devil says, well, it ain't that way anymore, but God, it ought to be. I pray, Father, you'd help us tonight. God, I pray that you'd bless this young family. God, the others that should be here tonight and are not, I pray, God, you'd help them. God, we must in this church be burdened. God, God, for our young people, I pray, Father, tonight, God, that you'd help us. Dear Jesus, would you help us, Lord, to worship. God, every time we get opportunity, God, to praise you, God, let us praise you. Anytime we have opportunity to lift up your name, God, let us do that. Let us not be ashamed, Father, to worship thee. God, let us do that which is right. Lord, in your sight, help us tonight. God, we don't know what to do, but just ask you to help us. Yes, God. God, we, we know you will. Amen. God, we're praying right now for the help of God. Yes, God. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jones. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. We have been challenged.